Have you been accepted to medical school this cycle? Congratulations. Are you still hoping to be accepted this cycle? Are you planning ahead for next cycle? Today's guest is going to discuss his path in med school, as well as how you can excel in medical school while enjoying the experience. Welcome to Admission Straight Talk, the podcast dedicated to graduate admissions and helping you approach the application process thoughtfully and successfully. Your host is Acceptance founder and world-renowned admissions guru, Linda Abraham. At Accepted, our mission is to get you to that unforgettable moment when you read your acceptance email and shout, yes, I'm in, confident you'll be attending the perfect program to help you launch the career of your dreams. Hello and welcome. Thanks for joining me for this, the 418th episode of the Mission Straight Talk. Before we meet our guest today, I want to invite you to accept its next masterclass for med school applicants. Alicia McNeese de Moncar, Accepted Consultant, will present Create a Winning MCAS Application on April 22nd. The name pretty much says it all, but Alicia will explore with you how to create an engaging personal statement, AC activities, write about your most meaningful experiences, as well as manage your time. You can reserve your spot at accepted.com slash 418-WIN. Again, that's accepted.com slash 418-WIN, W-I-N. Our guest today, Dr. Wendell Cole, graduated with a degree in biology and medical virology from Georgia State University in 2014. He attended Morehouse School of Medicine and graduated in 2018 at the age of 24. He has been an orthopedic surgical resident at Tulane University School of Medicine and will complete his residency in 2023. He published the Med School Survival, Go- Survival Kit, rather, How to Breeze Through Med School While Crushing Your Exams in 2018 as he graduated medical school. Dr. Cole, welcome to Admission Straight Talk. <laughs> Linda, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, very nice introduction. Thank you so much. And a pleasure to be here. My pleasure. Now, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, where you grew up, that kind of stuff? Sure. Yeah. So I am a first generation son of immigrants. So my mom and my, my father, are both in the Caribbean, they, they immigrated here in the 90s or 80s, something like that, had me. And I was born in New York and I, I moved around a lot and I ended up spending most of my time in Georgia. So Marietta, Georgia um, is where I spent most of my time in Atlanta, Georgia. I spent the majority of undergrad and med school. So most of my life has been in, in Georgia. Um, grew up um, nobody really, you know, did medicine before, before me, it wasn't any other doctors or anything else in the family. And I, I liked sports a lot growing up and I started to play sports in high school. I played football and I ran track. And then another thing that I started to enjoy in high school was actually a TV show called house. It is, um, it's a, it's a, it's about a, they have a lot of different seasons, but it's, it's pretty much an intriguing show on medicine. And kind of that combination of the two piqued my interest in medicine. I always like science stuff and I always like sports. And to me, I thought, well, what's something I can do to combine the two? So I kind of went through undergrad, um, thinking I was going to do, you know, something science-y. But again, I watched House all the time. So I can say <laughs> that that heavily influenced me towards going towards the field of medicine now like sports. So uh, that kind of brought me towards orthopedics. Uh, per se. So I, I kind of knew it was something I wanted to do. And then I also injured my um, injured myself and had to have surgery when I was in college as well. So there's, there's a little bit of both sides to it. I see. So it wasn't just house. It wasn't just house. I had some <laughs> personal, uh, I had personal injuries. You know, I, I, if you want, I can tell you about it and you can go from there. Just I'll go briefly. Um, when I was uh, when I was in college, I actually tore my ACL and just horsing around, not even doing a professional sport, ended up tearing my ACL. And, and the thing that that took me with that is that after doing so beforehand, I expressed my emotions and by myself by working out. So I wasn't able to work out. So I felt a part of me was, um, you know, was missing, I guess, for lack of better terms. And then, you no know, long story short, I ended up getting an ACL reconstructed, being able to run again, you know, do sports, right. so that kind of birthed my interest and kind of giving me that form of self-expression back. So that's one of the reasons why I want to do orthopedics. Wonderful, wonderful. And so obviously it's a little bit more of a mature reason than watching House too. <laughs> <laughs> well, House, I mean, I love House too. I mean, okay, okay. You know, when I was show. a kid, it was Dr. Kildare, but okay, <laughs> it can be House now. 
<laughs> Looking oh, back, and I realize, you, you know, it's a few years at this point, but what was the hardest part of the medical school application process for you? Um, the application process. Uh, uh, going back a ways. Yeah, going back a ways. I guess for me, it was trying to figure out where to apply to, like how I went to Georgia State University. And I, for many years, I didn't know that we had a, a pre-med program per se, or pre-med like committee that can help you choose where, you know, places to go and apply to. So for most part, I was just doing it on my own right. and having, not having had anybody, uh, you know, in my family that, that was in medicine or anything. A lot of it was kind of Google and searching for different places where to apply to you know, where do I get my letters of recommendation? Who do I, who do I ask? You know, what are they looking for? So those are kind of the big, the big things we're trying to figure out where to apply to. And then, um, you know, kind of how you put together a pre-med kit, because some schools had a pre-med society and then the person in, in charge of that makes your letters of recommendations versus me. I was like, well, maybe I just asked a couple of my professors and we go from there. So that was probably the one of the bigger hurdles that I had um, okay. figuring out and, how to get to med school. And and did you? I mean, how did you? How did you overcome it? Did you just Google around? Did you? Uh, so yeah, friends? so you know, I, I Googled, and then actually, right in the city was Morehouse School of Medicine, and I knew that I was there. So uh, very old fashioned in this way, I just drove up to the school and walked in and said, "I'm interested in, <laughs> in going to med school. <laughs> you know, wh what can we do, or how can?" What are some steps that I need to take? And I remember now one of the admissions guys, his name was Brandon Hunter, very, very nice guy. Yeah, he let me go and sit in on classes um, as a as an undergrad, you know, just kind of showing my interest in med school, sitting on classes, speak to him, learn a little bit more about what medical school is like. So, you know, I, I was real old school in it and I just, just drove and went and walked through the doors and, and said, hey, I want to go to med school. I go to school not too far from here. What do I need to do? So okay, that, and then, you know, just applying where family was, that was the other part to it. Makes sense. What did you like and dislike about Morehouse Medical School? I like the fact that the, one of the missions is to help serve the underserved, which is something that I, uh, I'm passionate about, you know, having come from a background with not having too much, I, I'm always, you know, would like to give back to wherever, whatever, whatever our community needs it. So learning to, you know, serve the underserved, number one, that's a, a mission statement that I really agreed with, um, giving back towards the community, you know, even the classes that you learned about certain things such as racial inequality or gender inequality, that was part of the curriculum that you, that you learn, how to talk to certain patients that, that may not have, you know, the access to different healthcare or, or different systems that other patients may have to, may have access to. So just even those little things that, you know, coming to residency, talking to some other people never had any, any of that experience before. So that was one of the things that I liked. Um, I liked the fact that I was in a big city. You're at a big trauma center. The hospital is called Grady Hospital. It's right in downtown Atlanta. And you get a, you know, you get a great trauma experience. You get, a, you get to work with attendings um, from all over that, that are experts. Things that I didn't like. It's expensive. <laughs> okay, yeah, well, that can be about most medical thing. schools, yeah, for sure. Um, but, but yeah, just like you just said, but that's something that's, that's common with a lot of different medical schools. I mean, yeah. I, I don't didn't really have any necessarily bad experiences per that's se wonderful. with Morehouse that's School great. of Medicine. I would choose it again if I had to. It's fantastic. Okay, good. Now you mentioned that you chose orthopedic surgery uh, because of your own experience, right? Your own in both interest in sports, and interest in medicine, and your and your experience with your ACL tear. Correct. But obviously, you were in. You know, you you had experiences after that also. And right. orthopedic is orthopedics is one of the most competitive competitive residencies out there. Right. Um, how did you explore it after your ACL tear? How did you settle right. on so, it? Basically? So coming into medical school as a first year med student, I, I was telling people I want to do orthopedics. And then one of my friends said, hey, have you heard of this program called Nth Dimensions? I said, no, I've never heard of that. What is, what is this program? That. Yeah, so the, it's a program and, and they, they've done a great job now. It's headed by Dr. Brian Simpson Mason. But the main overall goal is to try to help get minorities into the field of orthopedics. You know, not only racial minorities, women as well. You know, everybody, pretty much the underserved population. And so 
how they do is they pair you up with a preceptor. You know, for me, I, I, I was in, um, they sent us out to Los Angeles. You pair with a preceptor, you get to shadow a doctor, you get to have research research done. So you do research during this, it's two months between your first and your second year. It's called an internship that you do. So you go and shadow, you're in the operating room, and then you do research as well. And at the end of the two months, you have to present your research at a, at a conference. So, you know, that's something to kind of help already build your CV. So that was one of the, the main, you know, the, the one of the main big things that helped with my exposure to orthopedics, helped me solidify that's what, what I wanted to do and also help with the application. Like you said, it's a very competitive sp- yeah. specialty to get into. So you have to get, get scored. You need, you know, you need as much in your corner as you can. And then also it helped out because it was a network of people too. They had a network of alumni and network of, uh, of other students that were residents. So it, it served as a source that I could help um, go to if I had any questions or I needed advice or I had to figure out where I wanted to rotate as a, as a third year medical student. Sounds like it gave you the, the network and support you kind of lacked yeah. when, when applying to medical school, right? Correct. Yeah. And, and even where I was at Morehouse School of Medicine, there was no department of orthopedic surgery. So pretty much anything that you, if you want to do orthopedics, you had to go and find it yourself. So that helped, you know, tremendously. And I, I, I thank, you know, the interventions program. And when it's my turn to give back to them, I will yeah. definitely have, hopefully have a couple of med students with me and, and, and just kind of keep the same thing going. All right. Sounds good. Um, I'm, so obviously just you were coming from a program that didn't even have orthopedics and going into orthopedic surgery. Was that the most challenging part of the residency process for you or was there, there something else? Well, you know, Linda, I'll, I'll say a very challenging part was in third year or starting your fourth year, you go and you do away rotations in right. orthopedics. And so you go to different institutions and you are not, you don't want to say competing, but you're trying to make yourself look the best that you can. So I felt, um, and, and the thing, most of the other people have orthopedic home programs that, that they have been sitting in for years or listening to grand rounds or, you know, they have, mm-hmm. they have time to go spend with the residents. So they have some type of a, a knowledge base of what orthopedics is, kind of the nomenclature, how to deal with certain situations. But myself, you know, very limited experience. I know myself as well as some of my other classmates that were going for orthopedics. When we, when it came time for us to go and do our rotations, we fell way behind the curve because we didn't. They threw an X-ray on the on the on the screen. I didn't. I didn't know what it was. I had no idea. I can tell you what's up and down from left, from right. And so it was a, a really steep learning curve trying to figure out what I needed to know in a short amount of time. You know, you're you're on a rotation where there's maybe five, six other people all competing for the same spot. So that was probably, you know, a big hurdle to try to work, be on time, be early, you know, stay late and read when you get home just to try to be as caught up as you can. But, you know, a way to just overcome that is just trying to be the nicest person you can, um, working the hardest you can and, and just, you know, having a good outlook on, you know, being in, in residency or being able to get the chance to go and travel somewhere and help other people out and learn from other people. That's a perfect segue into your book because that's one of the points you make <laughs> in the book. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So why and when did you decide to write the Med School Survival Kit, which just to, I, I read it, it's a very good book and it has 4.7 stars with 113 reviews as of March 10th, which was when I checked. So yeah. I it might have might have more now, but uh, at that point it was again four point seven stars with one hundred and thirteen uh, reviews. So yeah, what motivated yeah. you to do it? Well, well Linda, well, first free of all, free time and abundance of free time in your fourth. I mean, it, that is one of the, the the big things. But also, so during medical school, my friend and I we did two things. One is that we we uh, started like this real estate investing company per se. You know, it was three of us, so. We did, you know, we, we did real estate and all of our classmates knew we did that. Mm-hmm. And we also were a part of what's called a network marketing business, but we pretty much traveled as well. So to my friends, all they saw was that I traveled and then they did not believe that I was in medical school because we <laughs> traveled and had fun and did real estate all the time. And so 
my classmates would say, how do you have so much time? Like you were all in med school here, but you keep traveling and having fun and doing things. You need to write down what you did or you need to like, you need to tell people how you did it for the most part. And in fourth year, just like you said, we had an abundance of time. And I was like, all right, well, maybe if this can help at least one other person, you know, I'll sit back, you know, take however much time I need to take in order to write, write this down and figure out what tease out what are the things that made things um, uh, work because it's almost like that. I don't know if you heard of the 80 20 rule, but you 80%, you get most of your stuff done in a small amount of time, you know? And so I had to try to figure out what, what that 20% of productive things that I did during medical school, what that was and how you can just own and focus on that. And so I try to make all that into a book, everything that I would have wanted to know, um, you know, going through the process, I kind of just wrote it down and said, here, you know, learn this. And uh, these are ways that I found that you can effectively study. These are ways you can travel. These are ways, this is how you can do good on step one and step two. And, and I mean, that's pretty much how the med school survival kit came out, you know. So it's, it's almost all based on your personal experience, right? You felt like you were yes. researching. No, no, it's all based on personal experience. And then there's some other there, like, for example, there is um, a section in a chapter on how to do research. One of my friends in med school, every time I spoke to him, he was like presenting at some podium or doing <laughs> something. So I asked him, well, how did you, how, well, what are some tips that you had for, for research on writing this? And then he gave me his tips and I, you know, I put it in the book and I put his name, of course, that he gave these tips. So a majority of it are things that I personally found over the years, but some of it are just tips from other people as well. Okay, great. Um, so what are your top tips for surviving and thriving in medical oh, school? Man. You don't have to go to the whole book. Just No, no, I think, you know, just the, the big, the big thing is at the beginning of med school, it's, it's really hard. I mean, it's really easy to compare yourself to a lot of the other, other students, you know, you get a grade back and you wonder how they're doing versus how you're doing. Oh, am I behind my head, et cetera. Yeah. instead of worrying about sitting down and, and, and running your own race. Um, and that can kind of start to stress you out if you're sitting and figuring out and trying to see if you're behind and you're comparing yourself to others. So one thing I'd just say, is just run your own race, know that this is your med school. You know, this, I, I know, I know people in med school that their path was five years instead of four, years, but it was still their path. You know, you, right. everybody has their own path. You know, you might not, you might not be the the guy or the lady that gets ninety nine on every exam, but you know, you you can excel in your own way as well. Um, that's number one, and then number two is I came with a process of called batch processing, and so how this came about is when I came into med school. I was, I had a job as a waiter. And then I also had this, this startup that we were trying to run. So I knew that I, I gave med school, you know, at the end of the day, I said, okay, I have, I only have a certain amount of hours in the day. I know that I have to at least have my time in to study for X amount of time because med school is pretty much number one. So I knew that three hours undivided attention goes straight towards med school, nothing else at the end of the day. And that means, you know, I'm not, you know, looking at Facebook, I'm not on the phone, you know, on social media, scrolling. I'm not reading and then saying, oh, hold on one second, let me go do this over here, this over there. It's just kind of just focusing all your attention on that one thing. And one piece of advice that one of our professors used to say is study like the test is tomorrow. You know, instead of passively studying, study like the test is tomorrow and you'll kind of get more out of it. So that is something that I realized early on and that helped out uh, a lot as far as being able to get certain things done in a certain amount of time. Because on the contrary, what I, I've seen a lot of people do is study, you may be studying for about five or six hours in the library, but you're not getting as much done like, or in that same amount of time. You know, so instead of you study for three hours, then you go and you see family and have dinner for an hour and then another two hours you relax, you're kind of in and out of studying for six hours family wants you to sit down and eat and you're just trying to like juggle a lot of different things so those are I guess some those are some of the big overarching general tips that can be applied broadly so one certainly is focus right when you're going to yes. study 
study, get rid of the distractions, just focus yes. and then know that you've, you've done it. Know that you, you kind of alluded to it just now, but I, I know in the book, it was a big thing. It was a, a regular program of review. Right. Yes. Yes. That's another a, thing. A big thing in, in there. Yeah, then, yeah. I'm a big, no, go ahead. Um, in terms of, of <laughs> crushing your exams, that was, that was really important. Right. Um, but there's an also an, an, attitudinal, an attitudinal element that I found both very appealing and not limited to just medical school. And one, uh, one tip in your book, and like I said, just really caught my eye was change an I have to, to an I get to attitude. Yeah. I mean, that's just a fantastic yeah. approach to anything. <laughs> right. Because no matter what job you have or what profession you choose to pursue, there are going to be some things that are more drudgery, drudgery like than pleasurable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's all part so, of so a true. package. That's Could you so unpack true. that a little bit more? Yeah. You know, you got to realize, especially if you've made it to the point that you're in med school, number one, they're so getting in med school, number one, is so competitive, so hard to do. You know, mm -hmm. there's, there are thousands and thousands of people that want your spot if you're in med school. So, just the fact that you're there and you're able to speak with, you know, speak with patients and they, they, they put their trust in you and they believe you, you know, like you're the person that, that they turn to for advice, you know? So it's like, and you get to do, like you get to, to be of service to other people. Like people will let you put them to sleep and, and, and cut their skin and perform surgery on them. You know, that's a very intimate and, it shows us how much trust somebody has to trust you in order for them to do that. People can, there are all types of things that can happen. People can die in surgery. People can end up paralyzed or a lot of bad, there are a lot of adverse things that can happen in surgery. So the fact that you're blessed enough to be in that position to be able to impact and, and help their life out and whatever it may be, it may not be surgery. It may be you're, you're talking and you're figuring out, you're doing a physical exam on them and you find out what the, that one thing that somebody else missed that can that can change their condition or help them live a, a less painful life or you know help their activities of daily living. So you know just just switching that whole like oh I have to wake up at six in the morning to go and round on these patients and work all day. So yeah, you know I, I get the I get the opportunity to wake up tomorrow and go help all these people out. Like that is the way to look at it, and that'll not only help you help yourself and help the day the day progress in a, in a good manner but also help the patients as well because the patients will see that that you know they appreciate you and you know it's just a it's a bigger responsibility that you that you get you know being in med school eventually you know being a resident or being a doctor or whatever field you go into like there are thousands of people that want your spot and you are so fortunate enough to have it like you should you that is the way at least I thought to, to look at it and that's the way that kind of helps you get through those long days it's a great attitude it's a fantastic yeah. attitude another thing that uh, came through in the book was that you were very committed and I think it's come out a little bit in our, our conversation today you were very committed to maintaining non-med school interests and activities so yes. you mentioned you had the real estate <laughs> business you had yes. you were working you obviously are interested in sports and in the book you say you had a you know a workout routine yeah. um do you think that maintaining those non-med school interests actually contributed to your success in medical school yeah I think so because you get to you know if you have something on your mind all day, every single day, and you don't get any time to, to de-stress or think about something else or, or do something that you really enjoy doing, sometimes people can get, um, uh, what's the word, feel resentment for, for going to med school or, or for or being a doctor and, and feeling like, oh, they, they spent the best years or however many years of their life studying while they could have been out doing other things. So I think remembering the things that, the things that made you who you were before you started medical school, you know, that that's who you are. You're also a doctor as well. But if you're somebody that likes to play the piano, if you're somebody that, that likes to go for a walk or you have your dog and you like to spend time with your dog or exercise and important to you, or if you like to watch house or whatever TV show it is, you should make time for those things 
for you to do those things that you want to do. You know, at the end of the day, you still have to remember that you are a person and you have uh, things that you that you like interest. If you like to travel, figure out a way to do that and kind of de-stress away from it all because it can get very, very hard and very, very taxing, you know, eventually very mentally draining because, you know, there, there, there are times in throughout your med school career where you're sitting down and you're studying for eight, nine, 10 hours a day and you're doing that for days in a row. And that can be very draining if you just continue to do that and do that and do that, but not have any outlet. If you like to go and play dominoes, whatever it is, whatever you like to do, you should just try to at least carve out a little bit of time to do the things that you want to do. That way you are, are happier overall. If a family is important to you, spend time with family. Like you need to do, create a list of things that make you happy in different areas of life and figure out a way to incorporate that. Because if you never make time during med school, you won't make time during residency, you will not make time when you're attending. So you got to start off early. That's great advice. Thank you. Yeah. Are there any steps you think um, pre-meds can do? Uh, let's say, if, even if they're applying, well, let's say they're planning to apply this summer, they won't start medical school till 2022, or maybe they just got accepted and they're hoping, they're planning to start, you know, this year, 2021. Any things that they can do to prepare themselves uh, for, frankly, drinking from the fire hose? <laughs> um, well, that, you know, that that's what it is. And it, it is drinking from a fire hydrant, right? And, and right. I remember thinking that, you know, maybe I should start to try to read some notes beforehand so I can learn, so I can learn this information. But then what you realize is that the little amount of notes that you read now is not going to equal up to the amount of notes that you actually really need to, to learn in med school. And one of our, one of our professors put it in a, in a great way. He says, it is, med school is like drinking uh, from a fire hydrant. With time, you learn to drink very quickly. So you learn to, you learn to, you learn to adapt in how to synthesize all this amount of information because the amount of information is, is too much. You know, if you yeah. try to learn all that information, you know, you'd be spending hours and hours a day studying. So I would say beforehand, I'd say kind of enjoy, enjoy life, prepare for what you do. You know, if anything, you can try to tease out a, a study schedule or figure out where things are important for you. But you will learn, you will adapt, you know, you'll, you, there'll be a lot of trial and error during that, during medical school or during those first couple, you know, first couple months of med school, you're trying to figure out how to learn. But it's like you said, it's like drinking from a fire hydrant, you know, you will learn how to drink quickly, but you can't just drink little sips at a time. You, you gotta, you gotta drink it all, you know, and you can't really drink it all of it before starting your classes. So, you know, my advice would be to try to relax, come up with a study schedule, figure out what's important for you, and then learn how to organize all the information that you will eventually get. All right, great. And that's actually something that you do cover in the book also, how to, mm -hmm. how to organize that information. Yeah. Um, any last bits of wisdom or advice for pre-meds, whether first-time applicants or re-applicants? Yeah, and that's, uh, you just said reapplicants, and, and that's the thing is that not everybody gets in on their first try, right? Like sometimes, right. you know, yeah. you, you, yeah, exactly, right? A lot, most people don't. And, and I think in a situation when, when you don't get in on the first time, that's kind of, it shows, well, how much do you really want it? You know, how much do you really want to uh, get into med school? What, you know, it's not about how many times you fall, it's like you always hear about how many times you get back up. So, you know, you go, you sit back, you you figure out where where you need to switch something up. What's what's something that what what didn't go well during my first round? Did I get a bunch of interviews? But maybe it's something in the interviews that I'm messing up, or or that I can improve on, or is it in my is it my grades? What do I need to do in order to switch that out? Because you know, it's all part of it all. It all it's all part of the story. You know, it all it's all part of your story and what makes you to to get to your path and you know i've seen i've seen folks start med school at the age of 40 i've seen start folks start med school at the age of 20 so it, it does not time isn't isn't a thing you know it, if it, it all the matters how how bad you want it and figure out why you want it you know mm. figure out what is the reason you want to to be a doctor or to go to med school or pa school whatever school it may be you know, was it, you know, you, you saw somebody that was close to you when you were younger have some type of illness. And, and that's, the, that's the thing that drives you. So in, in all, 
in all in any time where it feels down or you feel like this is so much information I don't know how to study or you know I applied twice so how do I get in you just try to think back to the thing of, of why you start off in the first place and that'll kind of be the thing that drives you unless you continue on to to move past that hurdle because it's all hurdle you know it's all mm. just hurdles and it's it, it, and you just learn how to jump higher and higher with each hurdle did you ever think i mean obviously i'm sure there are bad days really bad days in in the hospital okay yeah did you ever uh, whether as a medical student or a resident did you ever think that you made the wrong choice no, I wouldn't say that I thought that I, that I made the wrong choice. I may have, well, I may have thoughts like, dang, do I really want to do this? And I'm like, wait, yeah. I'm here. Yeah, you know, I, I, that, I, that thought has has come about before. Like, man, like, I haven't slept in 48 hours. Like, I, I'm still here. Like, like I chose this. Like, dang, okay, I really chose this? I guess I did really choose this. And you kind of just... <laughs> at the end of the day you got to remember like you you did choose it like this is something you wanted to do you know nobody forced right. you to apply in most cases nobody forced you to apply to med school uh, nobody forced you to be an orthopedic or or family medicine doctor or emergency medicine doctor you the one that wanted to do it so again just touch back to the why of why you're right. here in the first place and then and then also be appreciative of the chance that i get to be here there's a lot of people that are that are that are fighting over mountains and climbing hurdles to get to this point so let me not waste it right i asked that question because i think it's really important that pre-meds know that that feeling is really common yes for sure is is very very common you will there will be many nights especially studying for like your step exams you're like man what am i like i've missed all these questions like, oh, what am I doing here? Am I, am I even, you know, what, what you'll get is, is am I, should I really be a doctor? That's what it'll come down to. Am I worthy? Like, should I really, am I really doing this to be a doctor? Am I, am I good enough? That's what it'll, that's kind of how it'll all face through as like, am I good enough? Am I smart enough? I'm just not getting this down. And you just got to keep, just keep going. That's it. That's the only advice I have is just keep going. Just keep trying. That's what I get to do, right? Yeah, that's what I got. That's what I get to do. What do you wish I would have asked you? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know. I think you did you did a good job. We covered we covered covered a a good amount of things. Yeah, we covered a lot in a little bit of time, and I you know I I like the energy. Um, what do I that you? I don't know. I I think you asked everything that needed to be asked at the Mm -hmm. at the time you'd be at the at the at the right time. You know, I'm I'm a fan of kind of just going with the flow. And, and I think that, I think it, it went well. Okay, great. Thank you, Dr. Cole. I think then we're just about out of time and out of questions. So thank you very much for joining me and thanks for sharing your experience and perspective. Where can listeners learn more about you and your book? Yeah. So you can find me if you want to find me on social media. I'm not as active these days, but it's at I am Dr. Cole, I-A-M-D-R-C-O-L-E. And the book is the Med School Surviving Kit. I'm sorry, the Med School Survival Kit. And you can just find it on Amazon. So if you type in the Med School Survival Kit, how to breeze through med school while crushing your exams, it will pop up. Tell a friend, tell anybody, you know, hopefully this helps. That's my whole point. Okay, great. And we're going to link from the show notes at accepta.com slash 418 to Dr. Cole's book and his website, as well as to the masterclass I announced at the beginning of the podcast and related podcasts and resources. Listener, thank you too for tuning in to this, our 418th episode. Quick reminder to register for that upcoming masterclass, create a winning MCAS application. You can do so at accepta.com slash 418 win. That's accepta.com slash 418 win or from the show notes at exhibit.com slash 418. Don't miss it. I also want to invite you to participate in Admission Straight Talks. Thank you for your review contest. One listener a month who leaves a podcast review on Apple Podcasts, also known as iTunes, will win a free 20-minute consultation with me. You can leave your review at lovethepodcast.com slash A-S-T, as in Admission Straight Talk. Again, that's lovethepodcast.com slash A-S-T. I look forward to hearing from you and speaking with you. This is Admission Straight Talk, produced by Accepted, and I am your host, Linda Abraham. I'll talk to you again next week. 